Um, yeah, and thank you. So, um, yes, thank you for joining us. And um, for the 12th edition of Foral and Festival, we decided to produce an online cooking channel of our own, kind of um, an unconventional one that inspires uh, ideas, puts forward philosophical or historical considerations. And critical recipes um, in that way presents a program of performances uh, taking the model of a cooking show as an inspiration and departure points uh, to put forward critical discussions. So today's critical recipe is a little bit different to the previous ones because it's presented as a live uh, event. Um, and so we welcome the Center for Genomic Gastronomy and they're going to be presenting Nor a Norwegian national dish. And in this conversational cooking episode, you will be introduced to some of the possible ingredients and recipes that could vie for the title of Norwegian national dish. Uh, so the Center for Genomic Astronomy will discuss the taste, uh, symbolism and meaning of Norwegian plant-based uh, ingredients and discuss how evolving Irish foodways might be in dialogue with the foodways of one of its neighbors to the north. You will be introduced to some of the basic techniques for processing plant-based ingredients into building blocks for a delicious recipe. And we'll imagine a prototype and plant-based Norwegian national dish and discuss it in relation to evolving Irish foodways. The Center for Genomic Gastronomy, I'll just introduce them briefly, is an artist-led think tank launched in 2010 by Catherine Kramer and Zach Denfeld that examines the biotechnologies and biodiversity of human food systems. Their mission is to map food controversies, prototype alternative culinary futures, and imagine a more just, biodiverse, and beautiful food system. The center presents its research on the organisms and environments manipulated by human food cultures in the form of public lectures, research publications, meals, and exhibitions. They have conducted research in Europe, Asia, and North America, collaborating with scientists, chefs, hackers, and farmers. That's very brief because they do so much. And I'm really happy that, um, that they said yes to our invitation. Um, there was somebody that we've been following for quite a while and we've seen a lot of your events and of course uh, the lovely publications that you make as well. So i um, super happy to have you here. Thank you. Um, I'm going to let you take it away. Cool. Thank you very much uh, yeah, for the introduction and uh, it's nice to be doing something with Photo Ireland. We'll uh, talk a bit about our relationship uh, to Ireland and Dublin specifically a bit later. Um, but uh, just so you know geographically where we are all located Ed and I are sitting in Bergen, Norway, in Vestland, uh, in the western part of Norway on the coast. Oh, I mean, you're on mute. <laughs> it's not a Zoom meeting. I'm, I'm on mute. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in the north of Portugal. I'm Molly, and I'm in Cork, Ireland. Okay, so that's uh, our, our group. And um, we have uh, Kat is not here today. She is on babysitting duty. Uh, so our, our, our co-founder is, I guess, at the beach with, with the, the four-year-old. Um, so yeah, welcome to Norwegian National Dish. This is the very first public presentation uh, of this research, and we're going to be continuing it over the next three years. So this is actually a really nice opportunity um, to have this deadline and present uh, some of our initial research, both um, conceptual research as well as culinary research uh, on creating a plant-based uh, national dish for Norway. Um, we're doing this in part uh, in parallel with an academic research project, um, which is examining changing meat consumption patterns in Norway in relation to climate change. So um, this kind of goes in parallel to what some social scientists are examining as well. Um, so uh, the Center for Genomic Gastronomy has already been introduced, um, but let's tell you a bit about what we're going to do tonight. Okay, so uh, we're in section zero, the introduction, and then there'll be three other sections with content, which we'll tell you about later. But tonight we're gonna um, do some cooking demonstrations. That's pretty loose. We've basically assembled some ingredients and I've done some pre-cooking and we'll show you the results. And if you have questions, you can ask us now or in the future. Um, we might skip the pub quiz because we don't have enough competitors to make it uh, a viable competition. We'll see. In the we maybe do it. Um, and then we'll definitely have some survey questions. We might do those verbally uh, or, or use a digital tool, we'll see. So basically we'll tell you a bit about our uh, cooking research and we'll have some conversations um, about national dishes uh, in Norway. The three chapters for tonight 
is um, talking about the current Norwegian national dish, um, then talking about national dishes more generally, and then zooming out to think about vegan cookery. Uh, and I'm not sure if this word cookery is uh, used all across the English uh, speaking world. I actually first, I'm, I'm originally from the United States and I only saw the term when I was living in India and there was a lot of cookery books, but I really like it as a way of kind of summing up um, the knowledge that's generated often in home kitchens as, as opposed to uh, like fancy kitchens or science labs. So that's what I mean by vegan cookery, why we chose that word. Um, yeah, we should do this. So uh, we're gonna test this tool. If you have a phone, uh, you can get it out or you can certainly use uh, a website. Uh, if you go to menti.com, this will allow you to vote throughout this session. What's the link? Sorry, Menti. Oh, it's just there. I'm blind. Yep. Yeah. On the top of the slide, uh, and uh, that you put in that code, and then you press this heart. And that means you can participate. We started using this a lot uh, during COVID with all the online teaching, and uh, the students enjoyed being able to vote on things. That's really cool. I haven't heard of this before. <clears throat> So, um, how you eat, would you, what would you call yourself? An omnivore, a pescatarian, vegetarian, vegan, opportunivore, maybe you don't like vegetables and you only eat meat, we met one of those people before, or other. Okay. What's an opportunivore? <laughs> yeah, there's three people voted for. Who else wants to say? <laughs> Who's the third person? I don't remember. You're the second one. Yeah. That was me. I voted for opportunivore. I've been kind of looking for a word of like, I only purchase, I only eat vegetables when it's my choice. But if, if there's a host situation or if I'm encountered with something where I defend somebody, I'll eat what I'm given. So potentially opportunivore is not exactly the term here, but I think it sounded like where I'm headed. Yeah. That's exactly what I, I mean by it too. Yeah, like um, when I'm in my own house, I can be more specific about my dietary preferences, not restrictions. But if I'm out in the world and I'm at someone's house or a banquet or a culture that's not my own, unless it's going to make me sick, I'm just going to eat whatever is offered because it's fun to try new stuff. Who put other? Anyone wanna? I put uh, other, but now that I yeah, yeah. now that you described opportunivore, I feel I should have said opportunivore. <laughs> <laughs> what, what what were you thinking with other though, or what was your? Uh, well, no, I'm I'm saying I'm like 95 percent vegan diet, but um, if I'm yeah, like if I'm uh, with a host, for example, um, like when I visit my partner's home, for example it's it, the concept of veganism was very like abstract and it's like oh okay well here's some fish you know so well okay i'll have some fish <laughs> so actually okay. i suppose i am an opportunivore but i didn't know yeah. what that meant so i said other <laughs> i like it as a term too of flexibility because it, it, it signals potentially that you're going to make choices that are not normative in your own life but for example i, I can imagine um i've known people that say like oh i won't eat any meat unless it's like wild fish that I caught or someone else catches uh, or, or wild animals I don't want to eat, you know. So it's sort of this like pretty flexible term. Flex flexitarian. Term. Flexitarian. Yeah, what's, I have heard that, what's that one? I'm not sure. Uh, I heard flexitarian next as well. And I always thought flexitarian was like an omnivore. <laughs> so I don't really yeah. understand. <laughs> but I suppose an opportunivore is a really, is a really great word. Yeah. Um, cool, thanks. So, so that tool works. And uh, if we have uh, lots of people, then we can um, continue to use it, but we might just opt to do some stuff verbally. Um, okay, so this is a, a image of our group uh, uh, eight years ago now. So you can see we usually show up with lots of people. Um, so the Center for Genomic Gastronomy, I quickly want to talk about those two words because it can help us think about a Norwegian national dish. 
So gastronomy um, kind of is the art of cooking uh, and selecting and eating good food. And so the word good is an aesthetic judgment or sometimes an ethical judgment, and it's an art. So I guess we, ca we call ourselves artists, so that's the art side. And then genomics, um, sort of a technical definition might be the interactions between all of an organism's genes and the environment. But what we mean by it is taking a sort of biological or life sciences perspective on the food system and kind of paying close attention to things like agricultural biodiversity and land use and how those things in the environment uh, affect what happens on our plate in the sort of transition between those scales of biology. So basically um, we're quite interested in honing in on the flavor and the taste and the preferences of food and sort of what happens in the kitchen and as well as paying really close attention to the biology of food um, so yeah, that's what we do. And, and so why we've become kind of interested in this idea and concept of national dishes over the last three or four years is because the sort of industrialized abstracted food system has obviously kind of reached its absolute limit and all over the world and all over the political spectrum, people seem to be demanding that their food uh, be produced somewhat more locally or regionally or have some meaning that's relevant beyond um, calories or the McDonald's arches. And so um, as we think about the relationship of taste and place, uh, it's, it's worth revisiting this sort of uh, typology of national dish and what that means. So that's why we've gotten a bit interested in the topic uh, in, our, in our research center. So Ireland, why are we talking about the Norwegian national dish? Uh, our studio was based in Ireland for five years. We just uh, moved to Norway about uh, full time about three years ago, kind of right before COVID really kicked off. And we still have a lot of our stuff stored in Dublin. So in the upper right hand corner, you can see uh, where we used to work uh, on Henrietta, um, Henrietta Lane. Uh, and so I have a huge box of books, like 200 of our recipe cookbooks and other research books are in the basement of this uh, building. So I hope they're not water damaged. And we've done a lot of projects in and around Dublin and got to know kind of the, the regional uh, food system pretty well in that time. And I think there's a lot of parallels between Norway, especially the southern half of Norway, and Ireland in terms of food production uh, and climate. Um, there's a big emphasis in Norway on either fish or um, sheep uh, and some goats, goat milk. So there's a lot of sort of animal proteins, just like there would be in Ireland. Uh, the growing seasons are a bit shorter here, um, but there's a lot of uh, similarities uh, in terms of some of the farming that happens, um, a lot of the, the produce uh, that's generated. Um, so some of the big ones are obviously uh, potatoes and carrots and cauliflowers and different brassica species. Um, where we are specifically today, Bergen is um, known more for its fishing and is very uh, rocky, it doesn't have a lot of arable land. And so it doesn't have, uh, in my experience of it thus far, the uh, richer, um, uh, fields where you could grow lots of veg that's just a bit further south here in Stavanger. So Stavanger might even be much closer to Ireland in terms of uh, what's being produced. But we think there's definitely some conversations um, historically and, and then that, that are happening today uh, between uh, these two places. What else I want to tell you about Ireland? Yeah, we miss it. We want to go see our friends and we hope that, that the borders open up and we can visit everyone in, in Dublin again. I would say one other actually big difference um, is that Ireland, when we were there and starting to really talk to a lot of farmers, there seemed to be, um, from, the, from the top level, there was the idea of to go big or get out in the farming sector. And so whether that be uh, in terms of um, beef production or other kinds of production, there, there was sometimes policies uh, that tended to try to increase the scale and efficiency of farms. And Molly we, uh, might talk to us later, we might talk about uh, fish farming in Ireland and sort of how that's been a directive. But from the bottom up, um, whether it be from the uh, farmhouse cheeses or community supported agriculture, there was kind of a lot of uh, activity around relocalizing food systems. And uh, I think Norway hasn't had that full uh, activity yet. There's a few small experiments we found here, but even joining a community supported agriculture um, group in, in Ireland was fairly easy. And even though we've really looked hard, we finally found one CSA here in the west of Norway, but it only lasted for one year and has closed since. 
And we could talk about why that difference might be. One of them is that Norway is just a, a much larger geography. And so the supply chain to get fresh uh, veg and other materials across the country uh, means that it's just more challenging um, to, to, to have stuff be stored for a long time without going off. And uh, there might be other reasons as well that we could talk about. Uh, Adin is from Bergen, is a lifelong uh, Bergen, a Norwegian person. I don't know if there's anything, you have any initial thoughts about, as we've talked about Ireland and Norway comparatively, or, you, or what we've seen here? No, I mean, when I grew up here, it's always been fishing, of course, of fish and just in general seafood, I think. That's been on my mind when I think of both Norway and Ireland. Mostly. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, most of the seafood we do get here, uh, and the supermarket, as opposed to a special fishmonger, is salmon that's been farmed. Uh, there's some white fish and smoked mackerel, as, as I eat in the studio at least once a week. <laughs> and those are kinds of the dominant uh, fish cakes as yes. well, yeah. which is a big uh, west of uh, Norway uh, dish. Yeah, processed fish cakes, which is like this gorgeous, just brown fish cake. Yeah, yeah. true. Yeah. Uh, and, and actually, we were talking about before the presentation, even though salmon has some amount of uh, presence in Irish culinary traditions, I literally, even though I lived in Dublin for like five years, I don't think I ever ate salmon once. So I don't know what I was doing wrong, but I definitely eat a lot of salmon in Norway. So yeah, that was my fault, probably. Not what I <laughs> okay, so um, let me just quickly introduce our three other members, and they'll tell you what they demoed and researched, and we'll talk more about uh, why they did those uh, things. Uh, so Emma Conley, who's sitting in the north of Portugal, uh, has been working with the center for going on eight years and is originally from the US. And uh, for this research uh, has prototyped um, some uh, fermented uh, uh, dried vegetables to make a vegan charcuterie. And she'll tell us a bit about the process of trying to transform root vegetables into um, a rich umami uh, chewy substance. Um, Adin, who's uh, sitting here with me in Bergen, Norway, has been um, working with us more closely, uh, specifically looking at Norwegian um, food issues in a lot of different angles over the last year. And she prototyped an oat milk yogurt, yes, which was actually successful yes. after a little bit of... Yeah, trying and failing. Yeah. yeah. Which is awesome, because I also tried it and it did, I did actually not have success. But my oven light went off, so that might have... And the issue. And then um, it says featuring Molly Garvey, because uh, Molly um, worked very closely with our studio when we were living in Ireland uh, and, and really was the sort of main food researcher for us for about two or three years and was the person that connected us with a lot of the food producers in the country, um, helped us learn about the different um, food production at different scales, as well as working in the uh, test kitchens to develop recipes, which we then serve to thousands and thousands of uh, mostly Irish people and some international visitors. Uh, and she has um, prototyped um, some gravlax, some vegetarian uh, sort of salmon-like substance. And Molly, do you wanna say anything about your, your previous time with the center or revisiting your, your role as a food researcher? Uh, it was, it's been very, very, I always find now actually the work that I did in 2014, 2015, 2016 meant, has meant that any sort of headline about food that's meant to grab your attention now, I'm kind of like, <laughs> we, we looked at that, we know in vitro meat, we've done that. <laughs> so it's made me relatively cynical uh, of cert certain future, future foods. And uh, since so in that interim period, I've been actually working in Cork and I have to say I'm coming to the session with, it looks like gold nail varnish, but it's actually tomato. Um, they're called sugar ackles and it's the thing, they're, it's green, it gets on your fingers when you've been harvesting tomatoes for a really long time and it only comes off with alcohol, not water. Uh, so as proof that I'm still working, literally. You have your hand <laughs> in the soil. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, this is actually a good. Oh, Emma, do you have a question? Sorry. No, I was going to say the tomato's fingerprints are on you. Yeah. Right. Yes. Exactly. Oh. They hit. 
<laughs> Molly, I wonder if you, when we were working together, Ireland seemed to be having a renaissance in two or three things, or at least should, I should say the, the, the Dublin region, because I unfortunately didn't get to go out to the West nearly as much as I would have liked now. Um, so uh, would you say that, um, so what, a couple of things I noticed at that time, there was a, a few big uh, conferences around sort of a community supported agriculture and smaller scale farms of different um, kinds of agroecological approaches. And there was also a ton of restaurants that were kind of reducing the amount of meat or even going like vegan with no animal products. Uh, is that kind of something that's continued for the last two, three, four years? Or have you seen other big um, movements under underway? Yeah, it's a really interesting time at the moment in Ireland. There are, I think it's our fifth agri-food strategy is due to come out in the next few months. And um, this is specifically for the food industry, but there's more and more awareness of how food is a cross-departmental thing. You know, it's in schools, it's in health, it's, it, it's food poverty is a real thing in Ireland, which we're only kind of realizing now um, because you have other reports saying that Ireland is the most food secure, you know, but there are still people that can't have a hot meal more than once a week. Um, on the kind of local food network and alternative food network side of things, I've uh, community gardens. So there's roughly 2000 community gardens in Ireland, which actually isn't that much compared to other countries. So for every kind of 2000 um, people, there's one, one community garden, does that make sense? In a city in Dublin. Um, comparative to in Berlin, there'd be one for 90. Uh, in London, there'd be one for 200. Um, so we're lagging behind a little bit. And there's a really interesting move to, to formalize how local authorities in particular um, legislate, support, fund community gardens because it's quite haphazard across all the counties. So I think that would be one of the most exciting things that's happening at the moment on a community scale, but there hasn't been that many community supported agriculture. And the only other thing I would say is that with the pandemic, suddenly everybody was super into gardening and there was seed shortages and there was compost shortages and soil shortages, but now everybody's going on holiday. And if you are a small scale gardener, if you did look at the uh, pandemic and you're like, people are into growing, great, I'm gonna get into the business. We still aren't so into the food culture that we don't decide to go on holiday in January and stay around in Ireland when the weather is good and uh, the harvest comes in, you know? So like, it's kind of this disconnect between people who are small scale growing lots of different kinds of vegetables who need though that like footfall who need to be able to sell it immediately mm -hmm. they're missing their market right at the moment when all the tomatoes are coming in or all the opportunities are coming in so there's still a little bit of a cultural disconnect um thanks that's a really great update and i was uh, one small thing that we should pick up offline but I, we learned about this in portland oregon which had done so much interesting work on the regional food system was this missing um, spaces for small scale food processing because a lot of people wasn't because there was a vacation as such but you had people making really interesting um, small and medium amounts of food but they're not being like an um, affordable space or education on how to process that into ways that could preserve it, um, it, it rather than just selling it to a really large you know um, a bundler or a conglomerate so they sort of opened up these regional food processing centers where people could bring their their veg or learn about how to process it. Uh, and that was sort of really interesting uh, site. So we should chat more about that. It might be an opportunity. Um, cool, thank you. Okay, um, so we'll do a bit more talking and then we'll show you some results. Um, so Norwegian national dish or Norwegian nationalret. Is that all right? That's right. Yeah, Nationalret. So we're gonna, this project's gonna be mostly bilingual. We'll try to be doing it in, in, in Norwegian and English. Um, and that's in part because it's about Norway. So it makes sense to have as much as possible in Norwegian, but I think it's also about uh, making it accessible to a, a global audience who's rethinking um, what food means in their place and what it means to be part of a national food culture. And so um, we'll also be doing it in English. And my Norwegian is, uh, I was told by my four-year-old last night to stop reading the book because I'm reading to him in Norwegian using like my accent. So 
I need to practice. Um, so uh, why are we doing this project? Specifically, why are we up to it? Um, well, one thing that we learned is that uh, Norway is a really interesting test case because it has a tradition of having national conversations about what the national dish should be. And that is because uh, in, it was, uh, the national dish was chosen, I'm not gonna tell you the year, because maybe that'll come up later, uh, by a radio program. And then it was also re-litigated in the public uh, discourse uh, recently. So it kind of already has this tradition where the national dish is talked about um, at the, by the whole country. And why we're particularly involved in this is, as I mentioned before, we've become more and more interested in land use and the relationship between what happens on the plate and what happens um, in the landscape. And national dish is a really nice way of looking at that. Uh, so that's why us, a couple of other why us is. Um, we want to just learn more and more about agricultural biodiversity. And so for the last three years, we've been talking to Norwegian scientists who are working on different varieties and breeds of vegetables. We recently talked to a scientist who focuses on, uh, wasn't cabbage, it was cauliflower. Room call. Yes, actually all kinds of brassicas that are grown in Norway. So it was all kinds of brassicas from kale to cauliflowers to cabbages. Yeah. And partly uh, that research was looking at what different eaters around the country might want and how to introduce new novel varieties because mm -hmm. it's uh, a fairly narrow variety of vegetables in Norway. So my understanding is both because of the growing type and because of the centralization of supermarkets, you can get the same cauliflower in the far north and all the way in the deep south of, of Norway. If the cauliflower will be like exactly the same. Uh, so whether you're in the Arctic Circle or in Balmy Kristjansson, it's uh, the same cauliflower. So we're interested in agricultural biodiversity as well as standardization, um, as well as like the relocalization of food production and consumption. Um, and also it's been very interesting to see globally uh, this sort of strange moment in the last five years where a sort of technocratic elite who I guess we're a part of, honestly, having this conversation, are like, well, we should eat less meat to save the climate. And the idea is that um, reducing meat consumption is potentially environmentally healthy, uh, as well as potentially healthy for humans and has some climate impacts. And then you have farmers who have different strategies and how they employ animals on their farms or not, uh, who are kind of sometimes caught in between wanting to change what they're doing, but looking back to tradition. And then you often have more um, nationalist or populist political figures who can sort of make fun of like veganism and really have uh, used that as a way to associate eating meat with usually like masculinity and nationalism. So that's definitely happening here in Norway. We've seen this conversation play out in the media. I will just give you two quick examples. There was a student, uh, student led a holiday meal at the University of Bergen here that had uh, reduced meat and I think had some fish in the off offering. And then there was a series of sort of conversations about how this was terrible and like ru ruining tradition. And that was a few years ago, three or four years ago now. And that was the first sign that something was up. And then recently there was a series of debates um, between the Green Party and the MDG and the sort of uh, far right FRP uh, party about this topic of reducing how much meat is in the meatballs that gets fed to elderly people in old people's homes. So the idea is that uh, the, the meat would be reduced to 80% of the meatballs and 20% would be reduced, uh, would be replaced by lupin flour. And this is something we had previously run into research in Scotland. There's a scientist we know that is doing the exact same research in Scotland. So that was very interesting. But the populist party started, uh, I've heard from other friends telling me that the populace said, we didn't fight World War II to, to serve 80% uh, meat. This is a disaster for the old people. Um, there's also been uh, some debates about Ikea serving less meat. And the response has been, well, Ikea is not the government and they can do what they want. So there's a lot of tensions between these uh, different groups. We're gonna tell you about some research we've done. Yeah, to keep you, to keep you interested before we get into the weeds with the uh, policy. Okay, so when we're prototyping 
a Norwegian national dish. We're looking for vegan ingredients that are grown in Norway. And we want to create a recipe and share it with others. Those are the four steps that we have so far. Yes. So we'll show you what we found. Okay. Should we show them the oats first? We can show them the oats yeah. first. Let's see. Um, so when you set yourself a task like this, you find some weird things. Mm -hmm. Are you going to show them? Yeah. These are oats that are sold in relatively well-stocked shops in Norway. And they're called black oats. It's like literally just, that's what they're called. They're called black oats. And um, historically, this is an oat that used to be grown here much, much more. And until we started in the 1800s importing white oats from Germany, then this one, we just, didn't we didn't stop growing it but apparently what happened is that we found out that let's uh, feed these to racehorses instead because they contain a lot more fat and less carbs uh, in these and they were great animal fodder and they're still being used for animal fodder and still being sold in supermarkets so it's basically it doesn't look any more different uh, from your regular white oat when it's been uh, what's it called? Rolled? When it's been rolled. Uh, when you have it steel cut, it's a bit darker, but it's not much difference. So it just looks like regular oats. Uh, Svat have yeah. black oats. Yeah. yeah, and the strain is called Avenus trigosa, and it's, it's grown everywhere, and it's most popular as animal fodder, really. Um, Do you, you know, did you run into when they started feeding it to humans again? I don't know if you come across that. I don't know. Maybe we should I'm, find out. This is a funny transition. Like 150 years, it's like been shunted to, just for racehorses, and now it's fit for human consumption again. No, I'm not sure actually, um, but I think this has been in the shops for a few years actually. I'm not entirely sure. Um, so it was really high fat, and we were thinking what one could do with a high fat oat, and so we thought we should make an oat milk uh, yogurt. And that's in part because when I was thinking about vegan cookery, some of the things that you are looking to replace are the textures that you get from dairy products. So you're not trying to necessarily simulate things like yogurt and cheese always. You can have your own interesting uh, take on those. You don't need to have exactly like a simulation, but yogurts are nice, a nice thing to have in terms of um, how it performs in the kitchen. Yeah, uh, I've never made yogurt before. Uh, so this was super fun uh, to try out. Um, I can remember my grandmother actually making a sort of a separate thing with yogurt culture in the kitchen, uh, but it's completely different. I tried that as well during this process, but uh, one of the things we did uh, was just really to strain these oats within water and just really give them a cook until 80 degrees approximately, and then they literally just sat in this beautiful little bowl of mine on my bedroom floor for about eight plus 12 hours and then just ended up with this and this is with berries the way I would probably serve it and it turned into this really wonderful light airy yogurt and it's it's quite beautiful actually should yes. we give a, a texture demo <laughs> we can give texture because I was actually really surprised that you have to go it's it's just really thick and nice it's <laughs> it's, I've tasted it and I've had my partner taste it as well and he's not a fan of yogurt but he said this is quite peculiar and nice so that was good to hear and I think uh, so I, we were not sure if the high fat really helped that performance but it definitely I've seen a few vegan yogurts that are homemade and this one seems really successful so it'd be worth uh, in figuring out if these black oats that have such a high fat content uh it seems like it naturally would make sense to make a more smooth and luxurious mm -hmm. uh, yogurt. Yeah. Um, so the basic process was to soak them, blend them, strain them. And oh, the culture, because that was a thing that we had a challenge with, was figuring out um, to do a wild ferment or how do we get a, do we get a pre-made yogurt culture? Um, so <laughs> mine was a disaster. We won't talk about that. So how, tell us about yours. Yeah, I did look for some vegan alternatives of uh, yogurt culture. I don't know exactly where the uh, where the bacteria origin is in the vegan cultures, but um, there is one 
we made two different ones. One of them are based on soy and one of them is based on coconut water. Um, there's one particular one called Yokus that is probably sold. It's I know it's a product that's sold in Norway. It's probably not made in Norway. And then you have Alpro, which is two, the two cultures that we've used for this. The Alpro one has a, like a definitive um, chalky texture in the sort of feel when you get it on your teeth, sort of. Um, the texture is a bit different from the Yokus one, and the Yokus one is definitely more sort of light and airy. It gets that coconut water mm. up. And I, I'm, I'm quite sure we don't grow coconut in Norway yet. <laughs> But, but yeah. Not warm enough. But you could use these now as a starter going forward, I guess, if there's a living culture. I hope so. Yeah. It could be interesting to test. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I think the idea here, right, with a lot of homemade yogurt is if you have a starter, if it's a wild ferment or if you've, if you've gotten some, um, you know, pre, pre uh, packaged um, uh, like probiotics, that you then can stir in the yogurt from the last batch and keep that going. And so it'll be interesting to see, I, I, there's been so much amazing um, development on vegan cheeses in the US I've been reading about. So it'll be interesting to see how some of this other knowledge gets generated or passed on. And then to Julia's question, um, the black oats, it, they're, 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 these are rolled oats. They're just called black oats because of the uh, type, uh, oops, there we go, the variety that they are. So you can see that they are rolled oats and um, yeah, so it's just the, the, the uh, agronomic variety. Yeah, they might look a bit darker perhaps, but um, when you see them in the wild almost, uh, they do have a darker skin uh, on, on the outside and that is rolled away as with most commercial oats. Cool, well, I think we should show you then a couple of other things while we have the camera off before we move on. We were gonna do this later, but I think we should do it now. One is we have a growing chart uh, of, of Norway that uh, I had laminated so I could just take it with me everywhere as I have been doing. And you'll notice that May and June and July are pretty light. So we started doing the research for this in June and we wanted to make sure that we had things available in June and July. And so you'll not be surprised that rhubarb uh, grows here and it's actually still available. Like, it's pretty hardy, I guess, we figured on the shelves. And so one of the, I think, challenges of the vegan uh, cookery is um, souring agents. And so making, you don't obviously uh, in Northern climates have as much or any access to citrus. There's plums in Hadanga, but no citrus. There's plums. You can probably make vinegar from most fruits. Yeah, you make vinegar, yeah, yeah. 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 But having that sort of like fresh squeeze of lime or lemon or Mediterranean, you're not gonna get. And so um, Aiden's also been working on a rhubarb vinegar and we can show you quickly the results of that. Um, this is like basically a bottle of uh, sour water because it didn't turn out the entire, entirely the way it was supposed to turn out. Um, this is a bit cloudy, as you can see. So there's probably a lot of yeast culture in every single part of this. And it is sour, but it's also really flowery and sort of, it has flower notes. And it's, um, nice. yep. Um, but it is definitely souring. So it might be going into vinegar, but it might just be a longer process than what we thought. Um, and the main ingredients in this is basically rhubarb and syrup. And then we had to, we really looked hard to find birch syrup because that would be something that you'd actually be able to produce here. Um, there have been pro producers of birch syrup, but it's not, we can't really find it anywhere. It's not stocked. It's not some, something that's being sold. But maple is also something that you'd usually be able to find in, in shops. So you have like your average maple syrup. This is from Canada, and this is the one we've been trying to use for this particular vinegar. And, um, and then you use juniper berries to just get a little bit of yeast from the berries to make everything starts. But it's not finished yet. We're still waiting for this one. So I guess, uh, Molly, that could be the solution for all the, the vacationers. I mean, one of the easiest things to grow, I guess, is rhubarb. So I have a huge rhubarb collection party and make a, you know, an Irish rhubarb vinegar, something uh, along those lines. Mm -hmm. And then we should have one other food product, which is uh, a rapeseed oil. Uh, and I'm showing this because two reasons. Um, 
when I think about non-animal fats and oils, that's really challenging in northern climates. Um, obviously, you know, you have beautiful olive oils um, in, in the south of Europe, um, but there is this one brand of, of uh, rapeseed oil that's grown and produced and pressed in, in Norway. And it's at most supermarkets, it's not obscenely expensive compared to, I mean, everything's expensive in Norway, but yes. you know, uh, it's, 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 uh, you could, one could buy it and not feel like uh, queasy with the price. Um, but that, that, that we're just showing because that is one of the challenges and we were even looking for nut uh, production and nut oils. Um, there's not actually a huge amount of nuts that we could find in nut oils that were easily. No, most, most nuts are more or less foraged and you can, uh, there are people who have moved to uh, like a bit in the Northern part of this, of the Western country here. Uh, that actually have tried to start growing nuts commercially and uh, we haven't actually heard back from them but they have an amazing hazelnut farm that looks absolutely brilliant and uh, we'd love to catch some fresh hazelnuts from them because it's uh, it looks amazing what they've done there they have a huge farm but it's not grown commercially anywhere really not here so those are the experiments that we've done in Bergen uh, yeah, and I guess we'll go on to the other, the other groups, but uh, yeah, the yogurt was pretty successful way on the, the rhubarb. Uh, good. I need to share again, I see. Okay. Um, so I'm going to skip a lot of, of, of things I think that we don't need to do because we don't have the numbers, but we can certainly talk about them. So this is important. Before we get to Molly, why does Norway need a new national dish? Okay. I'm just gonna give all the answers to the pub quiz. Oh, I guess we could probably do it with three people. Yeah, before, we'll, we'll try it. Before I, uh, if you know the answers, uh, don't, don't uh, answer these. So before we answer this question, you guys are gonna answer some questions by doing a pub quiz. Yes, so for the person that joined us late, if you wanna participate, that would be great. Uh, you go to menti.com on your phone or a web browser and you put in this uh, number at the top of the screen. And once you do that, you should be able to participate in this quiz. Julie, I think unfortunately you already have the prize. So uh, <laughs> the prize for the pub quiz winner is a set of food freakings. Uh, books, but you, I think you already have those in your <laughs> store, but it's okay. I think I'm missing one. Good. Let's see who can participate. So um, we're going to ask you what the current national dish of Norway is, and these will be your choices. Lutefisk, taco fredag, folka, or smalahova? Smalahova? Smalahova. I did it. I did it. Good. So on your phone... You have to put it, oh, you have to make a name for yourself, of course. Sorry. Good, okay. So you don't have to rush because you don't get more points for answering phone, or for answering quickly, but look at your phone and select one of these dishes. <laughs> Nobody picked the correct answer. <laughs> okay, well, I guess those of us that do the answer were answering wrong, but still somebody got it wrong. Okay, good. So um, Faika is the, the uh, national dish of Norway. Faika is a dish um, that has three ingredients, which we'll remind you of later, which is uh, sheep on the bone. So mutton with cabbage and with black peppercorns. You put those three things in water and you boil them. And like a lot of national dishes, it's fairly uh, simplistic and it comes from often uh, yeah, a peasant tradition or just a home cooking tradition of meat, a veg, and some water. Um, taco fried egg means taco Friday. That is pizza. And, uh, I think Norway eats the most pizza, frozen pizza in any country in the world. And 12.8 uh, 
percent or something like that. More than 10% of uh, all Norwegian families have tacos on a Friday. So um, that's a big part of family culture. Okay. So again, you can answer this question. What year was Foyka first selected? People probably read the introduction to the, to the project, very good. Yeah, 1972, so there was a radio program uh, that people sort of had a conversation and that, that was selected. It's sort of interesting because my understanding of, there's a lot of kind of debates between the west of Norway, Oslo region and the north. And so for Christmas, there's a big fight about, should you eat um, pork rib? Skin rib. Yes, pig rib, pork rib. And here you have uh, pinachot, pinachot yeah. which is sheep's rib. Sheep's rib. <laughs> so the West Coast is like a sheep's rib that's salted. Yeah, salted. very salted. Yeah. And on the East side, you have this sort of pig rib with um, crackling um, skin that's uh, crunchy. Yes. Uh, so it's a, it's a, you can see why there needs to be a Norwegian national dish. Yes, in the Northern parts, you have lutefisk. And it's always very traditional. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> um, so we have two more questions, then we'll crown a, a champion. Ah. There we go. What time of year is foie call eaten? <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, well, again, nobody got the right answer. Amazing. Um, so the reason it's eaten in early autumn is that the sheep are in the uh, sort of uh, mountains or the fields for the summer and they come off those uh, feeding pastures and then they're brought in and harvested, as we understand it. And I can say that one of the most uh, fascinating farming farms I ever visited was we were in Melbu, in the north of Norway, off the coast, uh, an island, fairly remote area. And a man had a really small motorboat with enough room for basically just the farmer. And then he was bringing the uh, sheeps over one by one. Are there goats? Sorry, goats. Over one by one in his boat. He had like a herd of like 50 goats. And then he would put one in the boat, bring it to the island, and then come back into the next time. He was doing that all week so that he, they could stay out to that island for the summer and kind of cut it down. But it was lovely to see the farmer with his goats in the little boat. And they were miniature, I think, too. Miniature goats that are like the little puppies. So I think one of the challenges, and this is why this is like both fun and quite serious research, is like um, people have different relationships to animal rights and farming and eating uh, animals and the ethics about that as well as environmental concerns. But obviously we've met a lot of really amazing farmers that, work, that produce animals and they have really different responses when we propose a non-animal based diet. And so it's important to sort of have these conversations with lots of different kinds of people. Uh, and, you know, I'm often surprised that uh, people aren't very close-minded. They just have pr preferences or traditions that they're coming from that need to be like uh, thought about and worked through. Actually, the reason we were studying that farmer had almost nothing to do with the, uh, the goats. It was because he couldn't legally sell his sausages he was making because of the really strict Norwegian regulations. So he was selling his sausages on Facebook uh, under the under, underground sausage. Uh, Facebook pages. Okay, last question. Here we go. Oh, so sorry, these are the three ingredients of foico. And take note of the black peppers. One of the sort of interesting um, 
comments that came up when the, the sort of far right wing uh, environmental minister proposed a new national dish in 2014 was that um, it shouldn't have any foreign ingredients. So no, no pineapples on the pizza, no hummus because we don't grow chickpeas. And yet one third of the national dish is obviously black pepper only grown in like very warm climates. So there seem to be misunderstanding about the relationship uh, of these food products. Partly what that points to is this reactionary uh, approach to populism that we've seen in the last decade. I mean, of course it's not thorough, it's not grounded in fact, but it's just sort of not subtle. It's not realizing that this dish and really how it tastes and how people experience it has so much to do with the black peppercorns and how tied that is to the history of trade and colonization and other processes. They want us to ignore that fact and then make fun of chickpeas, uh, you know, as being some like uh, foofy food for the young people who don't understand tradition. So that's, uh, yeah, that's why that's there. Okay, last question. Okay, so this, this saying, chicken tikka masala is now a true British national dish. Chicken tikka masala is an Indian dish. The masala sauce was added. Aha, yes. To satisfy the desire of British people to have meat served in gravy. So this quote came from this sort of uh, off-quoted off uh, uh, lecture given in 2001 by the, the foreign minister in the UK uh, talking about British cuisine and um, how uh, chicken tikka masala had become a national dish, not necessarily the national dish, but a national dish. Um, and that's another good reason why we think national dishes can change. If you like just do Google or any basic web search, you'll find out that chicken tikka masala is, is a, or even the national dish of Britain. And that seems to indicate that over time countries change and their national dishes need to change to reflect that. Okay, so do we have a winner? Okay, so anyone who's not in our group and wants the prize, you need to email us a mailing address afterwards and we will send you your prize. So e e email us your mailing address or if you are in our group and you want an extra set of books, <laughs> we can send you some. Very good. Okay, that was just a little bit of uh, fun to have. And we have one question. Oh, yes, good. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna move on to uh, Molly, who's gonna show us her ingredients in her test kitchen, if that's okay. Uh, and so Molly, we yeah, why don't you tell us what you got up to? Yeah, hi guys. So I'm gonna bring you down to waist level. And here we have white on beige on, on beige. And actually it is a salt baked carrot. So I made a salt dough. It's a really high percent salt dough with basic flour I bought in the local shop, oddlums, flour and water and sea salt. So what we're trying to mimic here is lox or gravlax, which is brine salmon. So it's salmon that has been cured in salt water. Instead of what, we, what, we, what we're working with are root vegetables which are common in Ireland and common in Norway. And I decided to try carrots, parsnip and beetroot. However, the fiber in root vegetables means that a brine would be a little, a little more difficult and you wouldn't necessarily achieve the same texture as salmon just from a brine. So that's why we've introduced this additional step, which is essentially brining through the flour dough mixture in an oven. So we've, we cooked it at about 180 degrees Celsius for two hours. And now I'm gonna open it up and see how it looks. So 
So let's see. Okay, yeah. So we've got we've got a nice um, break down the middle there. That's a full carrot, and it's cooked. It already. I don't know if you guys can see that, but it already kind of has a bit of a shine, a bit of a gleam. So when you think about salmon, especially brine salmon, you often have a gleam or glimmer. Um, that is part of the aesthetic appeal of eating salmon. So you can all see though from, it's still quite thick, so we need to cut it down. One of the things you can use is a mandolin. What I'm going to use is my knife. Obviously, <laughs> One of the drawbacks of using roots is that this is the size of your fillet. So arguably, if you were a fisherman and you caught a fish this size, you might throw it back in the sea. But in, uh, when the soil is our sea, this would be a standard salmon, the equivalent. So we're working with smaller, smaller portions, but uh, imagine now that that is a fillet of salmon. The next step, like, so I can tell you, I've tasted this myself. You can see that the texture, it's, it's really quite smooth, quite soft. It breaks down very quickly. So that experience would happen in your mouth. And it is very salted. When you eat it, you have the, the texture that melts in your mouth plus the salt. What you need to do next is to, to, to make it, to flavor it. So it's up to you. I would put it into some vinegar. I have some thyme vinegar that's that is um, slightly purple because also we don't encounter salmon this orange very often. And then in the vinegar mix, I would add some dill, which is like a typical flavor pairing. And I'd let it rest for about 24 hours. And this is an example of what can happen. So this plate, you can see the carrots, which is looking, which are looking really, really well. The lighter piece here is actually parsnip. That was a, a test, but I wouldn't proceed with this any further because of the really high starch content. You don't get the melt in the mouth equivalent. So it wouldn't really remind anybody of salmon. And then there's beetroot, which is kind of an in-between between the parsnip and the carrot. It has a little bit more chew um, and could have people asking questions. But after this process, I began to ask myself, you know, when you, you begin, you begin looking for, you begin by mimicking, you know, you begin with mimicry and you're trying to find, um, you're, you're trying to mimic a sensory experience, but potentially as we go forward, five years, 10 years, the thing that we were mimicking might be protected. We can't eat it anymore. It might be extinct. Um, so at what point does, you know, the thing, the, the idea about that banana flavor, the sweet banana flavor uh, was based on a banana variety that's now extinct. So at what point does the national vegan dish um, become itself and not something, not a mimic? Nice, thanks. Well, that looked amazing the last plating. Um, one of the things we were talking about was that the diversity of salmon preparation. So I was really surprised when I first came to Norway 10 years ago and my mother-in-law gave me gravlax and I was expecting what I was used to from like New York, which is like smoked salmon, you get on a bagel, like this sort of texture. And I don't know, maybe I was eating cheap, like smoked salmon at like cheap bagel shops, I'm not sure. But what I got in Norway was so um, uh, loose and gooey and there wasn't a lot of chew. And I, the first time I had it, I wasn't so into it and I've kind of really grown to like it but it has such a different texture. And the way that my mother-in-law does it is just, uh, right? You just put sugar and dill and salt. That's nice, salt. Maybe, yeah. And just uh, wraps it in plastic for like a long time. And um, it sounded like the preparation you made would work really good in terms of getting at some of those Norwegian textures potentially. Um, yeah, it would do that. Full chew, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'd really recommend the salt bake. It really worked to, because essentially it's, it's a, a steamer, you know, yeah. the keeps 
all the steam coming out from the vegetable inside and it steams itself. Yeah. One of the things we, it looks fairly labor intensive, like you were saying with the size of the root vegetables and you'll see with the vegan charcuterie in a second with Emma that like, there's just a lot of labor that goes into these ingredients, whether they're attempting to simulate meat or just do something interesting so they perform well in the kitchen. But like the, if we think the yogurt as a metaphor, like most people don't make homemade yogurt, they buy it in the store. Like some people make it and that's awesome and it tastes better. But it seems like there's a happy medium between these super processed like vegan burgers I've seen that just are like no love is given and then doing homemade salt baked carrots on the regular. And so I know there's been a few smaller kind of vegan butchers that have popped up in Netherlands, US, maybe in Ireland, I don't know, where they're kind of working on more of a craft scale, but it means people can access these interesting ingredients, but not necessarily be at home doing like, you know, curing for days on end. Yeah. Anything, anything like that or? I mean, it's, it's like, I guess it is, it could be part of, you know, a just transition is that somebody who's really interested in bringing out the flavor in meat or bringing out the umami in meat and working with the protein there transfers that passion to bringing out the flavor or umami in vegetables. Um, another thing that I was interested in was that these flavors have developed out of a need for preservation. Fish lasts a week, meat lasts a week, a little bit more, maybe less. Root vegetables can store for a whole season in a bucket full of sand. Uh, so, so is it appropriate to migrate these techniques to objects that already store already? Well, maybe, you know, for the purpose of celebrating if we invest a lot of time in something, it becomes a celebratory thing, you know? And that, that's what a national dish could be. It's something that you gather around uh, to celebrate. And so maybe the time investment is worthwhile in that, in that case. Just like when you wait for a cut for the, the, the sheep to come off the mountain, you, know, you could be having these processes going and there's sort of a reveal when they first get consumed. And I think that as we've looked more and more at the food system over the last decade, you realize there's always just tons of labor and energy transference and then it's just invisible to most people and it happens to be that a lot of plant-based cooking a lot of the energy is the last mile it's people getting that root vegetable out of that that you know simple dirt storage soil storage and then processing in a way that's flavorful and lovely you have like a just a big piece of steak that lands up on your plate in the u.s and you're like oh it's so simple it's just a steak they didn't even do anything to it with some salts but actually right the energy transference of what it's consuming and the loss of sort of efficiencies there if you want to take that technocratic approach, but also just like the whole land use and the apparatus of getting that animal and um, even just uh, butchering and um, uh, aging that meat, that's all invisible. So I think that it's a good way to think about energy and labor and that this vegan cooking for us is pretty strenuous. Everyone here has been working their butt off for like a week to make these things happen because it takes so much time. But actually um, other food products have that labor as well. It's just done more upstream and it's invisible to us. Mm -hmm. hmm. um, good, well, let's, let's go right to Emma if that's all right, because I think we'll keep the camera off. Yeah, and you can tell us what you did. Yeah, um, okay. So yeah, I did, <laughs> I, it's been about a two week process. Um, I did my, so my goal was here to make a vegan charcuterie board. I have tried only small bits of it. So I'm going to cut it up now and do a taste test. I think, um, some might be failures and some might be delicious, just judging from what things smell like and look like <laughs> and some mistakes I know I made along the way. It was my first time working with Koji. So the, this is a fungus, uh, that grows spores um, or like starts with spores and grows a mold that helps to ferment your foods. Um, so I ended up doing two processes with Koji, um, but both started with this pack that I bought from a certified Koji company. Um, this small packet is enough to, to ferment five kilos of substrate. Um, so I, you start by diluting it. So this is why this is a two, two week process. So I, um, you basically uh, sterilize some flour by putting it in the oven. 
and then you dilute the spores using the flowers. So you mix it in with the flower. And the first process I did after that was to add um, these spores to some steamed rice. So you mix it in the steamed rice and the rice can't be too wet. It has to be kind of like sticky. And then that uh, ferments for, I forget how long it was, a few, I think it was 50 hours I did. Um, and I, that, that to let the spores grow on the outside of the rice. And so it was on a tray in my oven with me putting uh, hot water on a tray underneath. So the goal was to keep the temperature at, uh, well, I was doing 90, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, but so 90 degrees Fahrenheit is basically just having the, the light on. So the oven's not on, just the light. And then to be continuously putting um, boiling water underneath, I did it either once every couple hours and then the night I would just do it before. And, and it, it actually grew very beautifully, totally worked. So it's, on one hand, you have to really be babysitting it, but on the other hand, it was okay to be putting water in during the day and then for me to sleep at night. So that was good. <laughs> other people build out incubation boxes that do all of this automatically, but I tried to do it like the easiest, kind of most DIY way possible. Um, and so at the end of that, I had this rice that had this, the koji growing all over it. And from there, I mixed it in with water and um, salt and created like a basically a pickling um, brine type thing. So first I let this ferment for, I think it was four days. And then I mixed in a few other ingredients to in here. I think I can move this down. Yeah. So then I mixed in a few other ingredients. This has um, kelp, hot pepper, and um, oh, and sugar. And so eventually I put my vegetables into this and let them sit for another um, three or four days in the refrigerator. It was like a few hours out of the refrigerator and then a few days in the refrigerator. To prepare the vegetables, I, um, I used four different kinds. I think you can see here, yeah. Um, a turnip, a potato, a beet, and a carrot. So we were trying to use vegetables that would be accessible in Norway, even though I'm, I'm in Portugal, I was just doing this part here, which is funny because we have a ton of amazing produce. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm using the most basic produce, even though this is the height of the season, we have tons of amazing things. Um, and uh, I wrapped these with salt and left them in the refrigerator um, for a few days first before putting them into the, um, the pickling uh, container. And so I think, yeah, I'm gonna try, I've only tasted the carrot so far. It was really good. It was, um, the koji has a super sweet smell, almost like floral. And our whole house has smelled like it for <laughs> two weeks now. <laughs> First with the growing out of the, um, of the spores and then the, not, the putting the vegetables in. And then I'll show you the second process I did also. So the, the carrot as a pickle is delicious. It's a little bit salty, a little bit too salty to eat on its own. I think it's better if it was in a salad or even on a sandwich. Um, but the texture is really nice. It still has a little bit of um, a crunch. And then you really taste the kind of deep flavors in the, the umami flavor that comes out through the koji process. So I have these ones. Let's see the beet. I boiled the vegetables, um, actually just steamed them for just, I don't know, 10 minutes maybe before I put the salt on them too. So they were a little bit soft. And I'll show you, I had an accident with one of those. Okay, so I'm gonna try the beet. Mm, the beet is nice, it's, it's a little bit sweeter actually than the carrot. It's really good. Yeah, it's a flavor that's not, I wouldn't necessarily compare it to other pickles. <laughs> it's
it's a lot, um, it's a bit more like flowery um, and sweet. It doesn't have any kind of, it's not a vinegary flavor or anything like that at all. Okay, this one was a potato. The potato was really good. Actually, doesn't have as much of the salt. These two are saltier. I don't know if that's because the potato maybe didn't absorb as much of the salt or if it's because um, I somehow put less, which is possible. There's a lot of, I would say, there was a lot of um, uh, technical scientific approach going on here, but also a lot of artistic approach. <laughs> a little more, a little more uh, salt, a little less salt. Okay, and then finally here the, the turnip. This one I have not tried either. Oh yeah, that one's really good. Yeah, actually that might be my favorite. It has a little bit more of the spicy turnip flavor. All of these I think though, even mixed together into like a salad to put on other greens or something would be delicious. Emma, we oh. kept waiting for you to be like, oh, that one's not good. <laughs> They're all a little bit too salty. I don't like them so much by themselves. Like I would match them with something else because of the salt, but the flavor is good. I can maybe wash them more once I took them out of their their mixture. I just wash them really quickly in the sink, but maybe I would I would wash them, rinse them a little bit more and see if, because um, the salt should be mostly on the outside of them, not on the inside. And and so just for clarity, was part of this process, because I actually am unsure which process you use to transform yeah. the texture to be more like meaty, or is that not part of the koji process on this one? Um, this one is comparing a little bit more to pickles, um, but the, they, you can see, I think, yeah, the, here, let's see. It's not super soft. It is a, it's, it's, yeah, it's a pretty pickly consistency. Um, the flavor, it's more just that there's an umami flavor that comes out compared to the pickles, to a typical pickle. Okay, so now I'll show you the ones that, the other half of the, <laughs> the charcuterie board which um, use a really similar process, but I started with this, with the flour koji and put it, instead of putting it on the rice and then using the rice, um, I put it directly on the boiled salted vegetables. And I let it grow on them for, again, something like um, a day and a half. And then from there, once you have a really nice um, kind of white, you can see this how it's grown. It's the white outside. This looks like a sausage, right? But it's a <laughs> it is a carrot. Um, then you dehydrate it. So there was a phase where it looked like this, but the carrot was more a uh, full circle, and now you can see it's kind of shriveled and more de dehydrated. And so I dehydrated it for another few days after that. So the same thing. I used the same vegetables. It was the carrot. Um, beet <laughs> very this one is a bit sticky right now it looks really good uh here's the turnip and the potato and the other thing i did for this was after salting it i put a spice mix on the outside to give it a little bit more um of a flavor um yeah so spice mix the koji goes on top and then that goes into to the incubator oven. We, we weren't able to use the oven for a few days. That was uh, one side of not having a, a real downside of not having an incubator. And then, um, oh wow, it's beautiful. Look at that. Oops. Let's see if I can show you. So it has this really kind of yellow inside. What, this, one is one? The, this one is the potato. Oh, okay. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to try it. Oh, wow. It's, it's like the inside is like a caramelly texture. You would never know this was a potato. Julius, it's not hundred percent, like it's not hundred percent meat. Like, is it like a chestnut? She said it's the spice mix on the outside is a bit strong. I think I would do less 
uh, of that. It's, it was with some peppercorns actually. <laughs> and um, what else was it? When did the spice mix? I think it had um, a little bit of cinnamon and um, uh, <laughs> I can only think of the Portuguese. Uh, uh, what is the other name for salsa? Um, I, I only have all the Portuguese words so bad. Um, Tell us those. We'll figure it out. Uh, cilantro. Cilantro Coriander. seeds, is it? What'd you say? Coriander seeds. Coriander seeds, yeah. Coentros in Portuguese. Okay, so here is, again, this is like super caramelly inside. I don't know if you can see that so well. This is the beet. Wow. Also, I would maybe think that this one was meat. Does it still, oh. is it still very beetrooty? No, that's weird. Um, the, in, the, the outside, I'm going to eat just the inside because the outside is spice. I taste the spices, but the inside is almost like, um, almost like a mushroom. Ooh. Yeah, has a really intense umami flavor, more than the potato. Okay, let's try this one. This one is the, the turnip. I'm gonna cut off some of the spice mix on the outside because it's a little bit too much. It would be really good with something else like a, a vegan cheese maybe. <laughs> Not a regular but a vegan cheese. <laughs> These two are quite similar, the beet and the, um, the turnip. Yeah, I would never guess it was a turnip, not in a million years. And then we have the carrot. I'll just slice it a little bit so you can see. This one I tasted also already. It was, it's quite beautiful. You can see. And this one has a little bit of the sweetness and carroty flavor. It's really good. I wouldn't think that this one was meat at all, <laughs> but it has a really nice sweet kind of flavor. Okay, and then I will show you the one that I'm not gonna eat because I tasted it because I was afraid and I will not put it in my mouth again. <laughs> this was a, um, a butternut squash that I cooked the same time as the others. And it was, it got overcooked, so it was too mushy, but I thought, okay, I'll just go for it and see, see if it can apply the same process. But because it's so squishy, the, a lot of the salt got into the inside and you don't want that. <laughs> so it went through the same processes. I dehydrated it. It's kind of like, like the consistency is kind of uh, I'm trying to think of what the, I would compare this to. Here we have a sausage that actually is, in Portugal, there's a, a sausage that's very similar to this, actually. But um, the taste the, is just way too salty. So you really don't want to get the salt to the inside of the, of the thing. You want to keep it really on the outside. So yeah, I think that's... Um, sorry, I made a mess. It's not a beautiful display anymore. <laughs> But you can see a really nice kind of selection of a whole bunch of different flavors and different, uh, also visually, really different colors. Amazing. Yeah, that's, I'm really, really impressed with these, um, these ones. It's completely transformed. They, uh, they look great. We'll take some photo, higher res photos later to get some of the texture communicated. Yeah. The webcam, uh, I'm sad we can't try them. <laughs> over the internet but uh, the, you know when we had hung to dry a bunch of these in our studio previously emma it looked like those sort of sausage <laughs> the hanging sausage things so i think even with this processing there's something really celebratory about the look and feel and performance of it and i guess when we do this again outside of oslo in a few months we'll probably do like a hundred of these hanging in that um, kitchen lab and so i think that'll also have this really interesting celebratory potential and then like reveal yeah, and I think it could be really nice to use a few different spice mixes on the outside. Oh, well, one step that I didn't, I wasn't able to do that they also recommend is to smoke it 
before. So you smoke it, then spice it, and then put the koji on. Um, I wasn't able to smoke it in my <laughs> uh, current uh, living situation, but I think um, that could also add a whole nother kind of, yeah, level, level of flavor. And also the sort of ones that have more or less fiber and starch. And so there might even be, uh, as people learn, uh, try these new techniques, different plant breeding programs or selection of different cultivars to suit the needs um, yeah, of these processes, right? Because they need to act differently. I'm just gonna switch my camera really quick because now I can hold this up. Maybe you can see a little better just because it's so beautiful. Oh yeah, that's much clearer, great. Yeah, I was using an older webcam to see from above, but I think you can really see the details of the, and the koji growing up, that was growing on top. Nice. Yeah, pretty amazing. Um, thank you. Yeah. Oh, I would really want to. We have two more sections, then we can let you go. One question is, uh, or one section is, what questions do you have for us? This is a good chance to ask us anything you want about this research. And the very last thing we'll do before we leave is ask you a few quick phone questions about what you think the future national dish should be. But now, anyone that's not in the collective can ask us anything. I feel like I should have prepared some questions. I didn't know this was a section. <laughs> But I suppose um, I'm curious as to kind of uh, what's next. I mean, and how do you find um, like w w trying to do this research, but you're obviously all far away and you can't even get together. Like you said, you, you can't taste what uh, Emma has prepared, for example. Um, I mean, would you make the same food on your end, for example? And would you kind of share a recipe and everyone would make it? Or how, how do you kind of do this research? Yeah, so like internally within our studio, like COVID has been pretty tough because we've always been in, based in different places and then exchanging ideas across geographies. So for this project, you know, uh, border willing or whatever, uh, Emma will join us uh, in Oslo and we have like a kitchen lab we can use to kind of scale up those experiments she just showed. So that'll be the next stage of that part of the research. Um, and then the other aspect is it's like a three-year project. So this is literally the first public discussion we've done at all. So we're going to encourage other people. We'll, we'll try to like, uh, you know, get some high schoolers or university <coughs> students to make their own uh, recipes and ideas and collect those up onto this Norwegian National Dish website. Um, what Emma and I were joking about yesterday is uh, we just want to be ready. You know, if Norway decides that it wants a new national dish in 10 years again, because it just had a new one in 2014, we'll be ready with lots of recipes to pitch uh, for people. So I think that's part of the idea is really to experiment and have fun and to celebrate Norwegian produce, which I feel like can often get overlooked. I, I doubt if you ask 100 people who didn't live in Norway, um, <laughs> on a scale of one to 10, how good is, uh, you know, vegetables in Norway? It probably would not be super high. I could be wrong. So we want to change that because actually there is very good produce here and things you can do. Um, but yeah, COVID's been tough for sure because uh, like I said, we have been, been back to Ireland for two years. That's very strange. Because Emma, we were going to Dublin like every three, four months. Uh, Dublin was the last place I went before lockdown. Yeah. I wanted, I think too, I, I also was making um, a vinegar. <laughs> it looks totally different than Ivan's because uh, I think sometimes what we do is share a process, but then try to source ingredients that only, um, you know, that apply more locally to where we are. So I made a vinegar that instead of trying to um, necessarily find like a, a souring agent in a northern region, I was trying to make vinegar out of um, local ingredients and some of which that maybe weren't so good like we had these old kiwis that I think had been stored over winter and they just weren't tasting super good to eat fresh but also they weren't bad yet they were just really um mature and so the vinegar I'm experimenting with is um a kiwi and carob because carob production is really big here and they make a lot of um uh, sweet things using carob. So there's a, it's like basically carob syrup uh, and kiwi vinegar, which 
we'll see how it turns out. It's started, it's not ready yet. It'll be ready in a week or two, but it's, uh, it smells like vinegar. <laughs> it's starting to do its thing. But so I and I could share this process, even though we're using our own localized ingredients. Any other questions that people want to type in or ask? Molly, as a featuring, you're welcome to ask questions because we won't we won't see you for a bit unless you join in the you know mix. I guess at a certain point, I'm curious: Are you guys going to do taste testing? Um, I was thinking, yeah, I did a research project with with small scale cheesemakers in Ireland, and one of them had been a pure dairy farmer, and then decided to start making cheese, and he made four prototypes all cheddar with different flavors. And he did a test te taste test in his local Super Value in the 80s. So I'd be interested to hear where you guys think you'll get the most accurate sample for tasting national dishes. The next time we'll do a live tasting of this will be in a town called Os, uh, outside of Oslo, where the um, national, it used to be the National Veterinary College, but now it's the Life Sciences Agricultural all mixed together. Uh, NMBU, uh, Norwegian Milieu Biologique Universitet. I don't remember. Yeah, oh, gosh. Uh, I think so. And um, NMBU, and uh, there's a thing called Smak Os, the taste of the taste of Os, which is like it, it says what it is. People have restaurants and people bring food and taste it. So I think uh, again, everything uh, COVID dependent will be out there uh, with the other stands as this town comes together to taste everything. And because it's where a lot of the agricultural research happens in Norway, because everything's quite centralized here, uh, we would expect to get people off the street who have no preconceptions and just want to eat some interesting food, as well as like um, molecular biologists and veterinary scientists. And that's the hope. <laughs> So I don't know if that's what you meant by like a sample of the, yeah. And then um, the final present, so that's 2021 fall. And then uh, spring 2023, which is the next known thing, there'll probably be steps between, we'll do uh, a large uh, exhibition of this research in um, Trond Trondheim in Norway, uh, at the Trondheim Kunstmuseum. Uh, so that'll be a chance to get uh, people from a, even a more northerly climb in Norway to taste this stuff and see what they think. Ooh. Cool. Um, I think we'll leave it there. The last two questions were really about um, voting, uh, but we don't have so many people, so it's not that, that aren't in the group, about whether national dishes should be more like every day or if they should be more like exceptional and celebratory and also collecting some adjectives from people about what national dishes should do and represent. But I think we can save those questions when we have a, a, a more a sample, a larger sample size and or uh, more Norwegians. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, for joining us for the first public presentation of Norwegian National Dish. And uh, we think that if you want to fork this and make your own national dish program, vegan or not, for your own country, that would be awesome. I think it'd be lovely to have uh, lots of people contesting national dishes uh, all over the world. And it's OK if there's someone else that wants to make their own uh, new Norwegian national dish that's not vegan. But I think this could be a nice way to dream about and imagine different futures uh, in the places where we live. Good. Thank you thank so you much. Guys. Yeah. And thank you so much. That was, I think that was super interesting. Um, I mean, I never even considered, for example, the, I always thought of a national dish as something quite very traditional, I suppose, for a country, you know? Um, and yeah, I suppose I never thought about, for example, how a celebration or a performativity of a dish could also fit into how its tradition or its origins, you know? I think that's a, that was a really interesting point. Um, and also about, like you were speaking about visible and invisible labor as well. Um, yeah, I think that was super interesting. Thank you so much. Um, I think if uh, the people who are here, if you enjoyed today's episode, maybe I can bring your attention then to next week's episode, which is uh, Cooking Potato Stories by uh, artist Ana Nunez Rodriguez. Um, and tomorrow we'll also have a reading group on food as structural unit of politics, transmitter of memory and matter of art. Um, so somehow I, I really am enjoying how everything kind of is fitting in together, besides, of course, the overall topic of food for the festival, but also there's a lot of overlap 
um, between specific, I suppose, not just terminology, but also um, just different kind of subtopics that everybody's looking at. It's really, I think it's quite nice. Like, for example, one of the critical recipes episodes is from April Gerther, and she's trying to find what is a traditional Irish cake because everybody has different ideas of what that is, you know. So, um, yes, thank you so much. Um, everyone and I don't want to finish just without saying thank you to the festival supporters as well and um, we've been kindly supported by the Arts Council of Ireland, Dublin City Council and the Office of Public Works this year so I just want to acknowledge them and say thank you and um, yeah I'm um, a huge thank you I think that was just absolutely fascinating honestly I'm really um, super super happy thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for inviting us. Yeah thanks for the invitation. Thank you to everyone who attended. Hopefully we'll all be in one place at the same time sometime soon. <laughs> okay. Bye. We'll see you soon, Molly. Hopefully in Ireland. Yeah. Or you in Norway. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Julia. Thank you.